Sin más preámbulo, mi gente, les presento a Kevin Smith. Hola, everybody. Thank you uh, for wait waiting for me. Uh, it took a minute to get here um, through no fault of my own. But before we go, we're going to have a good time, kids. I'm going to answer any questions you have. Um, we're going to have where you tell jokes and stuff. Uh, if you have very small children, some of the jokes will be filthy, so get them out. Um, but that being said, before we take a step further, I just want to be serious uh, for a moment. There's a lot of important stuff going in the world, and I want to take this opportunity to address one of them. I'm going to be up here talking for a little while. If anyone, anyone thinks about coming up here and slapping me... <laughs> oh, I, I got you, I got you. Yes. I just want to tell you, I will fucking cry. I'm no Chris Rock, I'll hit the ground, man. So please don't try me unless you want to see a 51-year-old man weep. I'm so delighted to be here, kids. What a beautiful place this is. I have never been to Puerto Rico in my entire life. Isn't that amazing? Sad. But amazing. So I came in, flew in, flew in uh, this morning, and it's beautiful. You live in paradise. You live in an island paradise. I, I said to the folks who've been uh, escorting me around, the good folks at the con, I was like, I haven't seen water this blue since when I was a kid. Like, we were poor. We were raised real poor. My, my father worked for the post office. My mom didn't work at all. But my father insisted on going on vacations and shit because he worked at the post office. And if he didn't go on vacation, he would go postal and start shooting people. And shit. So he would always insist on going away and stuff. And generally, we stayed in the United States. We'd drive, take car trips and shit. But one time, my mom, who's a, a, a whiz at budgeting, uh, pulled together enough money to take us to the Virgin Islands. So when I was nine, I went to the Virgin Islands, which is wasted on a nine-year-old, because all I wanted to do was play Pac-Man, and they didn't have that and shit. So when I was talking to these folks earlier today, I was like, I, the water is so blue. I haven't seen water this blue since, like, I was nine when I went to the Caribbean. And they were like, you're in the Caribbean, motherfucker. <laughs> and I was like, no, we're in Puerto Rico. They're like, in the Caribbean. <laughs> and, you know, at that point, I had to explain, like, most of the shit I know about history comes from Disney World, so I didn't really... I was like, that was real? And they're like, yeah, the Caribbean's real, and you're in it, and then and the pirates, that was real. I was like, get the fuck out of here. And they're like, yeah, there's, there's somebody in the, in the, on the island is related to Blackbeard, probably. I was like, what the fuck? Why isn't that guy here, man? I'd love to hear from Blackbeard's fucking nephew or great-grandson. Um, I learned all about uh, pirates, and what was the other thing? What were they called? Corsairs. What is it? Corsairs. Corsairs, thank you. What, he taught me everything. Um, and it's gonna stick because when he was teaching me, I was smoking uh, amazing San Juan weed. So... <laughs> so the history was interesting enough, but I was like, you're fucking kidding me! A hurricane? Like, you know, shit like that. So it was wonderful to get to know the place. Um, and, and know that I had been here close as a child, but we never stopped. I guess we just kept going to the Virgin Islands or something. Nice to finally fucking be here. Now, I, I will be honest with you, I live in, the, even though I work in like Hollywood and, and most people think it's a sinful, horrible place full of sex, uh, not where I live. So I'm, I live in a world where everybody wears like a lot of clothes, even though we live in Los Angeles. Everyone's layered up and shit like that. My wife, wears like so many layers of clothing you would think she was religious or something like that She's, i never see her skin except when we're gonna have sex and even then the lights go off so you know for all i know she's been tucking it for over 20 years she could be a guy like um you know everyone in our world like her parents have lived with us the entire time you know that we had a kid our kid harley just moved out and bought her own house recently but everyone in my world jason muse his family Everyone, uh, don't applaud him, he didn't fucking come. Um, 
but all of us, like, we're all very clad. Like, you know, I, I never really think about it, but like, I, I tend to layer up and shit, and everybody else is fairly dressed. I got to the fucking hotel here, and the hotel's like right on the beach, and I opened the, the balcony door, and I went out onto the balcony, and it's just nothing but nearly naked people everywhere. Everyone in bathing suits. Like, I've not seen this much flesh, like, sit outside a Pornhub ever. Like, and that's how everyone lives. Like, you just, I grew up in a beach town and I forgot that, like, yeah, a lot of people in beach towns, they don't wear, like, a lot of fucking clothes. So, for the first, like, ten minutes I was in Puerto Rico, I was, like, an old man on a balcony looking at all these young people. I'm like, that's not a bathing suit. I took a picture and I sent it to my mom, and my mom was like, that's not a bathing suit. I was like, I know. Um, beautiful, beautiful place, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, I'm gonna share one quick story with you in regards to nudity, because I just remembered it, and, and then we'll get into what you guys want to talk about. Uh, this is something that happened to me not too long ago. Uh, we were having a book signing event in Los Angeles, and the event was gonna be at uh, the Chinese Theater, Groman's Chinese Theater. So. Um, I live in the Hollywood Hills. There's an area called Mulholland Drive, this big drive, you know, uh, uh, what's his name? David Lynch made a movie about it once. Um, it's a long strip that's on the top of the Hollywood Hills that is, gives you a beautiful view of both the valley and the city and stuff. It's deserted up there. Nobody's ever really up there. And I love to drive up there because there are no cops whatsoever. So you could do like a hundred miles per hour around these curves and shit like that. It's like Monte Carlo or something like that. Uh, sometimes I go up there just to drive and, and think and ponder, uh, write. You know, because writing isn't just sitting down at a, at a keyboard and doing this shit. That, that, a lot of that's muscle memory. A lot of writing happens when you're not sitting at a keyboard. When you're just walking around, when you're just watching something, when you're uh, daydreaming or whatever. So I go up to Mulholland, I'll drive around and I'll just think and whatnot, and then I go home and write and it just spills out because I've already pre-written it while driving around. So it's like my meditative place. I love going up to Mulholland Drive and just driving back and forth. So it was before the signing, I had like 20 minutes, and so I was like, I'm gonna take a drive on Mulholland, man, center myself, get fucking peaceful and shit like that. And so as I'm driving, you see people who hike to Runyon Canyon, they all come down Mulholland Drive walking home, you know, and they're sweaty and they're in shape and they're usually young and shit like that. And so I'm used to passing them all the time. And so as I'm driving on Mulholland this one night before the signing, um, you know, it's light out, it's like the, the dusk and shit. So I could see people, so I don't hit them with the car because there's no lights up there and shit. And I see, like, this beautiful image of youth. Um, two kids, obviously in love, one piggybacking the other down Mulholland Drive. So the story that I made up in my head as I was driving and saw them in the distance, I was like, oh, they're so cute. They're dating and they went hiking and now they're going home and she jumped on his back and, and that's love. I remember you doing that in fucking high school. I didn't jump on somebody else's back. I would have fucking crippled a woman, but like, <laughs> my girlfriend would jump on my back. She was much smaller than me and shit. And so I saw it in the distance. I was like, God damn it, that's beautiful, man. That's real fucking sweet. As I get closer, because I'm driving toward them and they're walking toward me on the other side of the road. I notice that like, she's not on his back. He's carrying her front forwards, man, which is even more impressive. Man, anybody can carry somebody on their fucking back, man. Carrying somebody like this, like, takes some fucking strength. And they're also going down a hill, so he's got, like, incredible leg strength. This is what I'm thinking, because I'm, like, I don't know, 500 yards away from him or something like that. Maybe 100 yards at this point. So I'm like, wow, he's fucking carrying her in the front. That's, that's, that's interesting. They're, they're more in love than I thought. Then I got right up next to him. And that is when I saw that they were fuck walking on Mulholland Drive. He was literally inside this woman walking like this and with each fucking thrust, they were fucking in front of me as I drove past. I almost went off Mulholland Drive. I couldn't fucking believe it. I've never seen anything like that in my life. I was just like, Jesus, the strength, the, uh, the fucking like the certainty you have to have to even try something like that. I was really impressed and I was like, did I fucking see that? You know what, I'm gonna turn back. And so I turned, 
turned the car back and fucking, you know, drove looking for them. They were still on the fucking road still. And this time I'm on the same side of the road as them because I'm going past this way and shit. And as I get close, I'm like, from the back, God damn it, I could see his clenched ass cheeks going like this. You know, and she's popping up over his head from the other side and shit. And I drove past him, I saw full insertion, and I was like, God damn it, man, fucking youth rules, that fucking rocks. <laughs> then I had to drive past one more time to get to where I was going, because that was in the opposite fucking direction. So I went past a third time and shit, and I told myself, like, I'm not going to look, because you've already looked, you pervert. But then I was like, wow, how do you not fucking look, man? Like, it's free sex, they're obviously exhibitionists, they're fucking in public and shit. I'm gonna take a look as I drive past. So now I'm driving past in the other direction that they're fucking walking and shit. I'm on the driver's side here and they're across the street. And as I get up close to them, this time, they both look right at me. Just as we pass, they fucking stop looking at each other. I don't know how the fuck they stopped concentrating on what they were doing, but both looked at me, made perfect eye contact with me, and this was the face that they made. Ew. <laughs> like I was the fucked up one, man. That happened six months ago. Not a day goes by that I don't drive Mulholland and look for those two people. Chances that they're in this room, very small, but if you're here, come on up on stage, kids. Um, all right, enough about me, man. I got some water, and I'm ready to answer your questions. Uh, we could probably turn the lights on so we could see everybody and stuff. Um, and uh, are there microphones in the audience? Yes, shit, yeah, there's one there. You can turn them, you can turn them fully on. I, I, don't, I don't mind. We're not having sex, so turn the lights on. That's awesome. <laughs> Look at everybody. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, man. It's awesome. Thank you for having me here, man. It's been really fucking nice. I, I was telling the kids that run the place, I was like, I'll be back every fucking year, man. This place is tremendous. Next time I bring Jay Muse with me. Don't fucking cheer him too loudly, though, because I tried to bring him with me. Like, when I got delayed and they wouldn't let me fly out until the next day, I was, like, real frustrated. I was like, why don't you come with me? And he was like, how long are you going to be there? And I was like, I'm flying in, doing the show, and then I fly out the next day. He's just like, that's so quick. And he goes, plus I don't speak Spanish. I was like, I'm pretty sure they speak English there. And he's like, next time. So next time, they'll be coming with me. Um, all right. We're going to start with you. There's the microphone. Uh, you're going to be up first. What's your name? Hi, my name is Anna. Nice Anna? To meet you. Yes. Everyone give it up for Anna. She's going first. So, um, I just wanted to say uh, it's been an honor for you to have you here in Ireland. Stop it. No, really. The honor's been on mine. I had some local cuisine as well. I had this thing. What is it called? It's a potato ball and it's got meat in it, but it was vegan meat. Oh my God, they, they, they got me like four really nice vegan meals and I was like, I'm not gonna eat till after the show's done and shit, but if I look heavy, it's because I ate that whole fucking ball and it was pretty amazing. So I, it's my, the honor's mine. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Is that it? That was no question, just a statement. Thank you, I appreciate that. Give it up, she made the statement, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Okay. How are you? What's your name? Hi, I'm 23. You're I'm, I'm a newly converted Kevin Smith fan. Oh my God, welcome to the club. 23? We made clerks 30 years ago, so you weren't even come when we made that movie. <laughs> What's your name? My name is Amberly. What is it? Amberly. Amberly? Yeah. Everyone give it up for Amberly. She's second. <laughs> Welcome to the club. How does this shit play to a 23 year old? Movies that were made like 30 years ago. Okay, man. I'm going to be completely honest with you. I'm a stoner and I fucking love your movies. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you. When I made those movies, I was not a stoner at all. And I didn't become a stoner until 2008. 
and I never, you know, I started making the movies in 94, and I never understood why stoners loved the movies so much. Then I became a stoner, and one day I smoked and watched all the movies, and I was like, that's why! Like, <laughs> I didn't realize I was working on a very particular wavelength. Okay, I smoked this as Tiva, so I'm really fucking shaky. Oh, don't be. Don't be. This is, a, we're, okay. we're here together, man. Okay, as an indie director, or any director in general, you create characters out of real people to catch that catch your eye or change your life, like Jason Mewes. Yes. Right now, in a director's perspective, would you ever create a character based on a weird slash funny slash cool female fan? It is doesn't have to be me, but you know. Is this a pitch? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm really humble like that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, look, I, I try, you know, in the beginning I just wrote what I knew, which was like being a white, being a white guy, a 20-year-old white guy. But like by the time I got to Chasing Amy, then I was like, well, maybe I'll try writing from other voices and stuff. It's always, you know, I feel safer writing for Jay because, you know, at least I grew up with him and I can understand him and process him and stuff through that filter. Um, but I meet people all the time that influence new new characters. Like, you know, I mean, he's not new, but like back in Clerks 2, Elias was new to our world. And that character came from a kid who used to go to Comic-Cons and used to like hang out at the booth where, you know, we sold posters and t-shirts and stuff. And uh, his name was Toad. Um, at least, I don't think that was his real name. I think that's what Brian and Walter called him. Um, my friends Brian and Walter like would run the stand and that kid went to Comic-Con, San Diego Comic-Con for 10 fucking years. Um, you know, we watched him grow up and when I started writing Clerks 2, I was like, I'm going to write that kid as a character. Um, so the short answer is it's distinctly possible. Um, the long answer is it helps if, if you're around me to influence me on a regular basis. So, would you be willing to move to the States? The, the if it's for state? you, I will sell my organs. <laughs> tell me here, tell me uh, the attributes that this character needs. Okay. Um, I'm not really a main character. Like, I would love to be like, an alternate character, like Harley's best friend in J.S.I. Bob. Look at you. So, fucking the kids, take a, take a note. Like, she's like, I'm not going for the lead, just give me something fucking small. And right away I'm like, I can do that. Like, I'm used to giving small things to women. Like, I can fucking... You ask my wife, she'll tell you. But yes, you didn't go for a big part. You weren't like, write me the next to fucking yeah. Alyssa Jones. You're like, write me fucking Millie's buddy. That's good. Alright, but what are the attributes? Okay. Um, there's really, um, I've seen your, all your movies, uh, almost all your movies, I'm Thank 23, you. you know. Um, <laughs> Which ones haven't you seen? Um, I haven't seen Dogma, I haven't seen Chasing Amy. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh my god, don't, don't light a candle, don't curse the darkness, for heaven's <laughs> sakes. This young lady, she's, she's interested in these movies, she just missed a few. Um, Chasing Amy was the one uh, that saved my career at one point. Like, Clerks made my career, Mallrats, oddly enough, like, even though people like Mallrats now, killed my career. Chasing Amy brought it back, and then Dogma kind of kept it going. So Chasing Amy and Dogma are the two movies that most people are like, that was the only time he was good. <laughs> After that, it was like all downhill. Then I got real into, like, my myself, like Jane, Silent Bob, Strike Back. Like, you know, Clerks is a movie about my life up until the moment that I made Clerks. Everything that ever happened in my life until then. Mall Rats is kind of a summation of what my teenage years were like. Chasing Amy was very much a summation of my relationship with Joey at that time. Dogma was all about my Catholicism. You know, I was fucking raised Catholic and I was an altar boy. By the time we got to Jane Silent Bob Strike Back, it, it feels like, I love that movie, don't get me wrong, but like when I watch it, it feels like I was like, we made four fucking movies, man. Let's talk about all of them in the fifth one, you know? And, that's what Jane Silent Bob Strike Back is, kind of like a greatest tits routine. Um, so, Chasing Amy and, and Dogma, which, you know, people are like, BOO, because you didn't watch it. Dogma's tough to find, um, so turn around and boo them right the fuck back. Boo. Yes, that's right. Now you've turned the tables on all these fuckers. 
Um, Dogma is tough to find, but you can watch it on YouTube for free. But you see, it's tough. It, it's not streaming, and it's not. You can't purchase it unless it's like a two hundred dollar DVD. Uh, Chasing Amy is is worth watching, uh, just as a as a historical document. Um, it, it put through the prism of today, it, it may come across as um, cringy. I've been told. Um, but, you know, I always try to remind people, like, we made that in the 90s, man. Like, give it a little space. But, yeah, check them out one day. Anyway, back to the character attributes. Okay, um, I don't want to take it any more much. Uh, fuck all them. It's you and me right now. <laughs> We're making a movie here. This is why I fucking love you. <laughs> okay, okay. Um... Give me three words. That she that I gotta include for this character, and then I'll let you go. A stoner shake, a rocker shake, and just a shake that doesn't give a fuck. That's a lack so of representation. So, girl J, essentially. Exactly. Yes. I yes. can do that. Yes. That's literally what I said. That's what I was thinking about. Like female J. That's what I said. Yeah. Done and done. I will honestly, like, if if you know, I almost died four years ago from a heart attack. If I continue living and get to make more shit, I will definitely do that. And when you watch it, you'll be like, holy shit, I told him to do that. And I will be somewhere spending all of the money from your idea. <laughs> um, all right. Now we're going to you. What's your name? My name is Omar, and basically it's a- Hold on, hold on, Omar, you're going too fast. You're, you fucking went right from my clip. Kiss me first, kiss me. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> Everyone give it up for Omar, he's next. <laughs> all right, Omar, the floor is yours. Well, basically it's going to be a follow-up from what you were talking about, Dogma. Are we ever going to have a Blu-ray of Dogma? They, they made one a few years ago okay. uh, before the, the license ran out. The problem is the movie was licensed to Sony, Columbia TriStar for home video, for a period of time. It's probably like 10 years or something like that. The movie is now over 20 years old. I think this year it's 23 years old at the end of this year. So all the deals lapsed. And the people that own, or the person that owns the movie, um, has been very preoccupied in jail. So, <laughs> yes, Harvey Weinstein owns Dogma, yeah. I'm sorry, I should have given you a warning I was going to say his name, but he personally owns the movie. Like, whereas, you know, Clerks uh, uh, and Chasing Amy and Jane Silent Bob Strike Back, Jersey Girl were owned by Miramax, the film company. Miramax made Dogma, but then Disney, which owned Miramax at the time, forced Miramax to get rid of the movie because it was such a polemic. So Harvey bought the movie personally and then made distribution deals with Lionsgate. Like we were the first big Lionsgate release and shit. Um, and that was theatrical. And then the home video was Sony Columbia TriStar. So we did the DVD, later on they did the Blu-ray of that and stuff. And I bought Dogma once, like off of iTunes years ago. And then it just went away because the deals lapsed. So my movie about angels is literally owned by the devil himself. And, <laughs> and he's in jail, so, you know, the movie is sitting someplace as an asset that I don't think he's allowed to own anymore. I'm sure he, you know, put it in some shell company or some shit like that. But, uh, yeah, I don't have access to it. Other than YouTube. I could watch it on YouTube all day long. People always ask me, like, where can I watch it? I'm like, you can watch it for fucking free on it's a, it's YouTube, and it's an excellent fucking copy. But it'll be a while before, like, the movie is available again, like, if, if he lets it go. I, it, like, I wanted to, there's one point where I was like, maybe I could buy it, my movie. Like, maybe I could buy it back and own my movie, because I don't own any of my movies other companies do. But then I felt really weird about putting money in that dude's pocket. Like, in order to take that movie away from him, somebody got to buy it. And if you're buying it, you're giving him money. If you're giving money, you're giving money to a fucking rapist. So, as much as I love Dogma, like one of my children, and it's, you know, it'd be beautiful if it was available for people and shit. It's got a great cast. Like, fucking people in that movie are still fucking famous today. Except Chris Rock. I don't know what happened to him after that. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a viable flick, but at the same time, it comes with... Baggage. Baggage with him. So, you know, I have a dream where, like, 
you know, one day I just get a letter and, and he's like, here, it's yours, or whatever the fuck. But that's never going to happen. So I don't know. We're at an impasse because I, I, ref I, I want it and it'd be good for me to have it out in the world and it would make a lot of money. But there's that Weinstein wall. Can I tell you something? This is gross, but it's not that gross because it's like, this is fucking years ago, right? But I just found out recently how much Dogma made on home video. Just recently. And when I say just recently, I mean fucking Friday. <laughs> Friday, we were having a conversation about something in regards to Dogma. And I spoke to somebody from Sony, from Columbia Tri uh, TriStar, who had released the movie. And they told me, they, th this was the person who was responsible for making the deal to put Dogma on home video. Um, so they knew exactly how much the, the movie made. Some information I don't have access to, believe it or not. Uh, particularly when it comes to Dogma, because uh, Harvey, since he owned it, didn't do any of the legal paperwork, didn't pay anybody residuals or anything like that. He just kept all the money. In order to tell you this, i got to tell you one quick story. <laughs> so years ago, Ben and Matt told me, they're like, Kevin, you got to get fucking a piece of Dogma. This is after the movie came out and shit like that. And I was like, well, why? Like, I, I got paid to direct it, I'm happy. The movie's out there, fucking, I'm, I'm delighted with it. And like, no, man, fucking Harvey made a lot of money off that movie. And I was like, how do you know? And they're like, he told us. And I was like, he told you? You wouldn't even tell me. And he's like, he told us how much he made. And I was like, how much did he make? And they said, personally, he made 20 million from home video. So I was like, what the fuck, man? Like, and none of that ever went back because the deal was so fucked up because Disney was like, get rid of this. And Harvey buying it was the only way to save the movie that he didn't do any of the things you're supposed to do. There are no residuals. Nobody ever got fucking paid money on Dogma after the original payment to be in the movie and shit like that. So that 20 million figure, like, you know, always stuck in my craw. But like, you know, my lawyers would be like, you should audit them. And I'm like, I can't audit people I'm in business with. That feels weird, you know. That was before we all knew he was a fucking criminal anyway and shit. So, you know, for years, I just let it kind of sit there and be like, wow, man, like, well, I guess, you know, fucking fuck me. In the future, I'll be smarter. And then on Friday, in this conversation I had with Sony, with, uh, not with Sony, with someone who used to work at Sony, who was in charge of the entire division and was responsible for buying Dogma and putting it out. So this cat knew the fucking figures. And I was talking to this cat and I was like, you know, Years ago, Ben and Matt told me that, like, Harvey had told them that he made $20 million personally off the home video on Dogma. That can't be right. And this guy goes, no, that's not right at all. We made $45 million on Dogma on home video. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, who? I, I don't even want the money. I just wish somebody had told me. Like, that would have felt nice in the moment. Like, you know, I'm, I make small movies. I don't know. I see the box office, but they, they don't conquer the world and shit. To have known that figure, like, my, for the last 20 years would have been a nice, like, feather in the cap. It's nice, I guess, to eventually hear it. Um, but fucking Jay was like, fuck hearing about it. Where's our cut? <laughs> I don't work that way. Like, it's never been about the, the money uh, for me. Like, I, I like the money, don't get me wrong. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a capitalist, not a communist. But I didn't get into film for the money. I got into film to tell stories, to be like, what? You mean I could just make a movie and nobody's gonna fucking stop me? Because I saw Richard Linklater do it and I saw Robert Rodriguez do it. So I was like, maybe I could fucking do it too. So my reasons for getting into it were never like, I want all the money and shit. And I'll be honest with you, like, I, I've been paid more money than I ever imagined I'd see in a fucking thousand lifetimes for doing stupid shit, for making pretend. Something I would do for fucking free anyway if they didn't fucking pay me to do it. So it never occurred to me to be like, yeah, go after the shit I didn't get. I got out of Dogma. I got to work with that amazing cast. I got to make the exact fucking movie I wanted to. And yeah, it'd be nice if it was out there and people were seeing it and shit. But, you know, the people that remember it fucking ardently love it. And maybe, just maybe, it's good that it's not out there. Because everyone remembers it very fondly. <laughs> you know, and if they were forced to watch it, they'd be like, this? Ugh. So maybe I'm getting away with something by it not being out there. But it does kind of bum me out, you know, like at one point in my life, that was the most fucking important thing in the world.
getting dogma done. I mean, literally, my life was in jeopardy because of it. We got death threats. Um, 400,000 pieces of hate mail and three legitimate death threats. And it's just so weird to have to be, accept the fact that it's like it's gone and it's probably not coming back. Um, but, but, you know, I'm, I'm not saying feel bad for me. I'm saying, like, I, I got everything I needed out of dog. And I have the memories and shit. And I've got pictures as well. Like, I know what happened. So I'm good. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Give it up for him. How are you? What's your name? Hi. Hi, my name is Julia. I'm an actor and singer. Your name is what? Julia. Julia, give it up for Julia, everybody. Thank you so much for coming here. No, for years there's been talk, mostly from a college friend of mine, to bring you here to Puerto Rico for a Q&A or a master class. And now it's finally come true. So when did you discover you wanted to pursue filmmaking and acting? Um, acting, like, I liked when I was in grade school, but, you know, not like, ooh, this could be a career, there's just some fun shit to do. Uh, I remember Sister, uh, Sister Anne Louise, grade three, we were doing this uh, play about, you know, playlets about parables and shit like that, and, um, I was playing, like, some fucking king who, like, didn't give any to charity or to anybody who was hungry and shit, and, um, I was eating pretend chicken. Like, so I was like, and thrown away, like one bite and thrown it away. And I remember my sister Anne Louise laughed, and I was like, oh shit. Like, that made me feel clever, because I, she didn't tell me to do that, I just started doing it and shit. So from an early age, I equated performance with validation. And that's what most performers equate performance with, validation. That's why we wait for applause and shit like that. You know, we wait for people to tell us how we did and stuff. So I love the validation that came from it. Like I wasn't good at much else. I was not good at sports. I was fucking a fat kid and stuff like that. But if I can put on a little performance, perhaps make you laugh, you know, that validated me in some way. So from an early age, I liked performance, but not enough to think about it as a career. When I fell in love with filmmaking, I was 21 on my 21st birthday. So 30 years ago, this August, uh, uh, no, 30 years ago, last August. Fuck. Um, <laughs> I saw Slacker, a Richard Linklater film. It was his second film. He had made a film prior to that uh, called You Can't Pl Learn to Plow a Field by Reading a Book or something like that. But Slacker was his first real feature. Um, and it got distributed and stuff. I saw that movie at the Angelica Film Center and Art House uh, Multiplex in New York City on the night of my 21st birthday. And it it was transcendent like great art will do that it will even even bad art can be transcendent and can inspire you know i have met so many fucking people who are like i do x y or z today because i saw clerks when i was a kid and that's fucking clerks so like imagine a really good film what it could do for a person and that's what slacker did for me when i saw slacker i was like this guy's just telling a story in like, in Bumblefuck, Texas. Like it ain't in New York, it ain't in Los Angeles where most movies are set. It's in fucking Nowheresville, Texas. Like the middle of fucking Texas in a town nobody's ever heard of. It was Austin, Texas, which is the capital of Texas. And everybody's heard of it except me at that time. But a little ignorance will go a long fucking way. So all I heard was like, this guy's making movies in his backyard, he's not asking for permission, he doesn't give a shit if he doesn't live in the most exciting place in the world. And I was like, well, if he can do that in Austin, Texas, maybe I could do the same thing in, in Leonardo, New Jersey, where the fucking store was. So I fell in love with the idea of filming, but we didn't have the internet, like that wouldn't happen for a few more years. So you had to independently study, you had to go out and get books at a bookstore, go to a library, and you know, it's like, not like you'd go to like uh, uh, Walden Books or something and get filmmaking books. You'd have to go to like college bookstores and shit. You know, there was a time where you had to kind of really work for it if you were interested in the thing. You couldn't just like be like, well, let me Google that and see if it could be my life. So in reading like Spike Lee's books on filmmaking, he wrote books on um, making his first four movies. Uh, and there was another book by Rick Schmidt called Feature Filmmaking at Used Car Prices. He broke down how to make a movie for $6,000. Um, reading those books made it seem possible. And so I was like, I've never done this before. I have no 
a visual acumen whatsoever. I have no college degree and shit. I have a high school degree at best. But I've been watching movies my whole fucking life. My father used to take me to the movies when I was a kid, and then that was a tradition that continued when I was uh, in my teenage years. I'd go to the movies with my friends. I was a movie kid. Like, some kids were into sports. I was into fucking movies and shit. And my father took me to movies for years, but he never once, ever, sat next to me and said, see this? You could do this, because we didn't come from that world. Like, now, I've been taking my kid to the movies since she was a fucking infant and shit. First movie we ever took her to was Fight Club when she was still in a bassinet. <laughs> so, that's right, I'm a good dad. So, that's so for me, like, you know, movies have been part of my creative DNA, they're part of her creative DNA. And I've been telling my kids since she was little, like, you could watch iCarly, which she used to love to do, or you could write iCarly. And one of them's way more fucking fun. So I've been telling my kids since she was a youngster, you can do anything. That's what we tell our kids now. Like, you can do anything. Figure out what you love to do, and then figure out how to get paid for it, and that's how you live your life and shit. But I didn't, I wasn't raised like that. Our generation wasn't like that. And my house was really not like that. And not because they were discouraging, but because there was no one to look at to be like, well, they did it. You know, you, you can't be it unless you see it. And we never saw it. We just saw famous people get more famous and shit like that. I just assumed directors were born into the business because like I'd never heard a backstory on a director or anything like that. My father was the kind of guy who would not encourage me. He would not discourage me, but he wouldn't encourage me for fear of failure. Like you'd be like, see that mountain? Never climb it, you'll fucking fall. You know, that kind of shit. And still, when I saw Slacker, it was like someone gave me permission to dream. Somebody gave me permission because they took this weird chance on themselves and their friends and their little corner in the world and told this story, man. And it, there I was watching it in the movie theater. I was like, why, why not them? Why, why them? Why not me? You know, I, I viewed the movie with a mixture of awe and arrogance. Awe because I've never seen anything like that before. But arrogance because I was like, I think I could fucking do this. If this counts as a movie, I think I could make a movie. And boom, my career was born. So it, it's, you know, a lot of things, but the, the spark was seeing Richard Linklater's slacker. My father taking, taking me to the movies my whole life definitely plays a big part. But seeing somebody do it in a place that wasn't the average place where it's done. Like, movies get made all the time in Hollywood. Movies get made all the time in New York. This guy made a movie in fucking Texas. So I was like, if he could do it in Texas, why can't I do it in New Jersey? And that started the journey. And then when I was making that movie, I was like, if this is the only fucking movie I'm gonna make, I at least wanna be in it, you know? So boom, I wound up being Silent Bob. I wrote the role of Randall, the funny guy, to play myself, which is why Randall has all the best jokes. But as we got close to making the movie, I was like, I'm not an actor, what the fuck? Just because I ate chicken in third grade does not make me an actor. <laughs> so I found Jeff Anderson instead, somebody I went to school with, I was like, you be Randall. And I chose Silent Bob. Silent Bob, I've written for this guy named Mike Bellicos, who's in Clerks. He's the guy when Dante goes, 37, my girlfriend sucked 37 dicks. He goes, in a row? That's, <laughs> still works. That's, uh, that's the guy who was supposed to be Silent Bob. But when I gave up the Randall part, I was like, if I'm gonna spend money on a credit card to make this movie go into fucking debt and shit like that, I, I'm, I'm gonna at least be in this so that once a year, I could watch this movie and see myself in it and be like, yes, there I was when I made the worst decision of my life. Never fucking bet on yourself again. So that's why I put myself in the movie. Also, so I could work with Jay. Jay was not a professional actor. He was just my friend. And I wrote that part based on all the shit he said and who he was. Like that, the character of Jay is literally just grafted from 16-year-old Jason Meeks. And I handed him the script and when I'd written Clerks, and I said, I'm gonna make a movie, and I wrote you a part. And part is so fucking you that it's the same name. So read it, and let me know what you think. And he read it, and the first comment he made was, he goes, I don't think I could do this. And I was like, why? It's you. And he goes, well, you got me saying shit like snoochie boochies. Why would I say that? And I was like, why do you fucking say snoochie boochies, man? So I spent a lot of time, like, teaching Jay to be Jay while we made clerks. Worked him like a puppet with my hand up his ass and shit. That's why I stand so close to him. But 
by the time the movie, you know, got picked up and shit, like, nobody ever wrote about Jay and Silent Bob. They would write about me and making the movie in the convenience store. They would write about Brian and Jeff as the actors. But nobody ever wrote about Jay and Silent Bob, except to say, like, you know, their character is, the director plays a character called Silent Bob who stands outside the store. So I didn't think they had any impact, like, whatsoever. Um, Jason Mewes came up to me at one point and he had this review from People Magazine for Clerks. And he's like, they talk about me. And I read it and the comment was, Jason Mewes, dash, you wanna find the rock he crawled out from under and make sure there's nothing else like it under there. <laughs> and he goes, is that a good review? I was like, that's a scream, man. <laughs> it's a huge fucking review. So it wasn't until the first screening of Mallrats that we had, ironically, at a Comic-Con, at the San Diego Comic-Con, um, in a, like, 200-seat theater, that I discovered that Jay and Silent Bob had found an audience, because Clerks had only ever played on 50 screens, in, on art house screens, and then it went to home video. By the time Mallrats was done, you know, and ready to start showing the world, Clerks had gone to home video. And so a bunch of people knew who Jay and Silent Bob were, because we had this screening and Jay and Silent Bob came out and fucking half the audience erupted. And I'll never forget that feeling because it's a feeling I've been chasing for the rest of my fucking career. It's the reason why we will tour Clerks 3 in the fall. Because I loved being in the room for that fucking sensation stuff. Um, and it was so, it was so amazing. Like, I was like, they know us. They fucking know our characters. And so at that point I was like, well, like I want to keep putting Jason Mewes in movies. So I'm gonna keep casting him, and now I just stand next to him, and I don't really have to act, so I guess I'll keep acting. And then I got like real jealous, because I'd write everybody lots of big speeches to say, and so in Chasing Amy, I wrote myself a big monologue to fucking spit out, and I couldn't fucking memorize it to save my life. There were too many words and shit. And I kept, like, throughout the making of Chasing Amy, I'd always, I would always ride Ben Affleck very hard about sticking to the script, because Ben is a mad liver. He loves to ad lib. He just loves to like do your dialogue and then make up some shit at the end and whatnot. The case in point, we're making Chasing Amy. There's a scene on the swing set where uh, he's sitting there with Alyssa, Joey's character, and she is describing fisting, the act of fisting. And she physically, she shows, she uses her hand and she puts her hand up and he goes, Jesus, doesn't that hurt? And she goes, yeah, we only do it once in a while. It's reserved for special occasions. And then the scene goes on. So we were shooting that scene, and I got everything I needed for it. I was like, this is great. We're done. Uh, let's go. Moving on. And Ben's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What do you mean, moving on? I was like, I got every piece. You guys are amazing. We're going to go to the next scene. He goes, let me do one more take. Let me do one more take, man. He's going, I got some ideas. I got some special sauce for you, Smittacles. And I was like, um, all right. We're going to go one more take because Ben's feeling creative. Let's go. And so we went, and fucking I sat behind the monitor put my fucking headphones on, I'm watching the take. Same fucking take, nothing changes. They're both on the swings, have the same fucking conversation. He's doing nothing new. We're burning film. He promised me something new. We didn't have a lot of money. We were trying to do as few takes as possible. And here he is doing the exact same performance. And I'm waiting for this fucking special sauce and shit. And finally he unleashes, this, unleashes the special sauce. She goes, you know, she does the fisting thing and demonstrates it. And then he goes, Jesus, does not hurt? And she goes, yeah, it's a reserve. For, we only do it once in a while. It's reserved for special occasions. And then all of a sudden, Ben goes, what do you do for not so special occasions? Just hit her upside the head with a fucking baseball bat? <laughs> and I was like, I didn't write that shit. God! <laughs> and I fucking went over there, like, to fucking dress him down. And you've never seen anyone more proud of themselves. <laughs> In your entire life, he was like, do you like that shit, Smittacles? I was like, no, I didn't like that shit at all. I was like, I'm trying to make a fucking really moving motion picture here, and you're talking about hitting people in the head with baseball bats. He goes, she was talking about fucking fisting, all bets are off and shit. I was like, do me a favor, dude, I know you like to ad-lib and shit, but I like my script very much, so just do the script. Just do the lines in the script and shit. If you want to make up lines, save those and put them in your own fucking script one day. And he did that and he won an Oscar fucking day. So, um, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't consider myself much of an actor. Um, 
because I, you know, I didn't ever really have to talk for the first 10 years of my career. Just make a lot of goofy expressions. But by trade, by definition, you know, if they were classifying us, I guess technically I am an actor, but I never think about it like that. Like, actors to me are like good at their job. I'm just Silent Bob. Like, I could play one character and that's about it. Silent Bob and Kevin Smith, I got two characters, that's it. But that's how I got to both film and acting. Way long answer to a very short question. <laughs> Well done. Well done. I know the guy who really sang it. Excellent job. Give it up for her right there. Wow. He showed up after all. I know your name. No. What's your name? Merlina. I what is it? Merlina. Like Merlin the magician with a Merlina. Everyone give it up for Merlina. What a great name. The way you spit out that, like Merlin, but with an A at the end, you must be doing that your whole fucking life. <laughs> My dad screwed me up. <laughs> okay. As a guy who named his kid Harley Quinn, I understand completely. Okay, so I heard you were looking for a female J. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. She beat you for the job, though. Okay. My question. Uh, you have you have talked about movies in your life, your influence, but of course, Star Wars is a big part of it. What is your Star Wars story? Do I have a Star Wars story? Yeah. I do have a Star Wars story. I have a few of them. Um, let's see, what's the best one? I mean, like, how did Star Wars got to your life? Because, for example, my brother, big brother, yep. that, he died of brain cancer when I was five. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. And he was the one that was the original fan in the family. Right. Now I have a Return of the Jedi tattoo <laughs> because of him. Aww. So I want to know, how did Star Wars got to you? Um, how did it get to me? My parents took me to see it when it first came out in 1977. I was seven years old. And, you know, I had been a fan of things prior to that. Like, I'd been a big Snoopy fan. I was a big Batman fan. But predominantly, my religion was Catholicism. Because I was raised Catholic. I went to Catholic school. So when they took me to see Star Wars, like I entered that movie theater, a little Catholic school kid, like an altar boy. But I left that movie theater a fucking Jedi. I switched religions because I was like, their fucking story's way better than ours. They got laser swords for fuck's sake. So it spoke to a kid at the right time in his life. It's a very simple story, right? Good versus evil and shit. Um, you know, the prequels get more complicated. That's about tax, I think. <laughs> um, but the first, you know, three movies, very like, these are the good guys, these are the bad guys, fucking go at it. You know, and for a seven-year-old who didn't really watch westerns, like my father was a big western fan, and I just didn't like them because they were, it's gonna sound so fucked up, but I just, I don't like, I, I never liked watching black and white movies when I was a kid. <laughs> <laughs> Irony. Um, so I wasn't, wasn't big into Westerns, but Star Wars, like I loved, and my father would get so frustrated because he'd be like, it's just a fucking Western. And I was like, well, I mean, they got guns, but these guns are way fucking cooler, man. And then you have to remember I was a kid, and so they started marketing toys. This was one of the first movies where they were like, you can play the movie at home now if you buy these toys. And I was in the sweet spot, man, so like I had a Star Wars collection, two Darth Vader, you know, heads full of fucking figures and shit. Which meant that I got to play Star Wars again and again and again. Now, we didn't have streaming or even home video in those days, so you had to, like, remember the movie until they re-released it and shit like that. Or, you had to create new adventures. And, you know, I would always choose the latter. You know, after Star Wars, it was like, man, I just want to do stories where Luke and Leia get married and fuck. <laughs> then that changed after Empire. <laughs> I met Han and Leia. Ah. <laughs> um, but I did a lot of make pretend with Star Wars. And because of that, you know, you could draw a, di a direct line from me seeing and playing Star Wars to the shit I do for a living. And not just like, hey man, remember the Death Star contractor scene in Clerks, like how we're always referencing the Star Wars movies? 
it, it, yes, absolutely, Star Wars has provided comedic content for me, but it captured my imagination at a young age and made me make pretend. Now, I didn't grow up to make Star Wars type movies and shit like that. I make movies where people just sit around and talk to each other about Star Wars movies. <laughs> but it still stands to reason that like, you're talking about a movie that was so powerful, not just entertaining for a kid, but such a powerful document for change, quite like Richard Linklater's Slacker, that it changed my body chemistry. Like literally changed the course of my life. If I don't sit around playing Star Wars as often as I did as a kid, I'm maybe probably not as imaginative as I am. And you know, if I'm not imaginative, and I'm not saying like, and I've got the imagination of James Gunn, no, but like I had enough imagination to be standing in a convenience store one day and be like, this could be a fucking movie, you know, and that comes directly from fucking doing this shit with Star Wars. Um, not to mention, like, you know, the late, great Carrie Fisher, who we worked with in Jane Silent Bob Strike Back, was my first crush. Like, I fell in love with Carrie at such a young age, and I had a framed photo of her next to my bed. Like, I had written to, like, some fucking, like, you know, Dear Carrie Fisher, I love you, let's get married. And she sent me a photo. I think she sent me a photo. And it said, galactically yours, Carrie Fisher. And it looked like somebody had written in pen on the photo. So I got that when I was nine. I still have that to this day. Now, I learned early on that you should be happy with what you have and not reach for more based on this picture. Because I had this sign, Carrie Fisher, galactically yours picture. I pushed. I soared too close to the sun on wings of wax. I wrote again to get another picture, to get a, di you know, hoping to get a different picture, different autograph. Same fucking picture, same fucking autograph. And I realized, oh, this is just comes off an assembly line. No human being even touched this or anything like that. So years later, I got to work with Carrie Fisher and fucking we were on set one day and I was sitting next to her and very quietly, I pulled out the Galactically Yours and I put it in front of her and I was like, will you personalize it, please? And she totally did. She was a hoot, man. Like, she had a real great relationship with Star Wars, obviously. It went up and down. By the end, she kind of figured out its place in her life and whatnot. But she was always very frank about it. She was like, you have to understand how this fucks with a person's head. And I was like, how? And she's like, because ever since I was 18 years old, I don't own my face anymore. My 18-year-old face belongs to some fucking toy company. She's like, they can make shampoo bottles that look like me until the day I die. She's going, that's fucking weird, man. And, you know, I was like sitting next to my Silent Bob action figure. I was like, is it? <laughs> but um, she, uh, how, she was funny. When we, uh, when we were making Jay and Silent Bob Shrek back, you know, it was a low-budget movie. It was like 20 million or something like that which is low budget at that point. And so nobody really got paid, right? So if people came in to do cameos, they got very, very little. So when we reached out to Carrie to do her cameo, um, she, her deal was she didn't want to get paid money. She says, there are these two antique beaver chairs that I've had my eye on. I want the production to buy the chairs for me. And I was like, fucking great, man. Like, this is, like, we're literally bartering with Princess Leia. This is amazing. <laughs> so we buy her the chairs, and when we're on set for the first time, I'm working with her, I was like, um, did you get your chairs? She's like, I did, thank you very much. And I was like, what's the story with the chairs? And she was going like, oh, the beaver chairs? She's going, I just thought that would be an appropriate payment for this movie. <laughs> and I was like, I fucking love you, Gary Fisher! Um, so yeah, man, Luke's, you know, of course I got to lightsaber fight with Mark Hamill himself, and, and then I, I was the guy that was like, what if he was Skeletor, you know? So it's influenced my, my life. But, um, it's influenced my, my life, my work, my art, my dreaming. But oddly enough, not to the point where I was ever like, I want to make a Star Wars. Like, I, I have no interest. I have no interest in making a Star Wars. I have no interest in making a Marvel movie. And these are movies that I fucking love, man. Like, I'll 
step on your neck to get to the latest Marvel movie and shit. But if Kevin Feige was like, you want to direct one of these? I'd be like, fuck no, man. That looks hard. But I would be like, but I'll be in it. Will you put me in it? Because that'd be way better for my brand than fucking directing it and shit. If you direct it, you could fuck it up and everyone hates you. But if you're just in it, you're like, not my fucking fault, you know. Um, so yeah, Star Wars, man, uh, gave me probably more than I gave Star Wars. But to be fair, I didn't give Star Wars as much as my parents. My parents gave them all the money and shit. When we went and mixed our first movie, Dogma, the uh, first time we ever mixed at Skywalker, not my first movie, the first time we ever mixed up at Skywalker Sound, um, we were like having a cigarette out on the porch, me and Scott Mosier, and there was like a rocking chair, like a fucking wooden rocking chair. And I was like, that chair? I think my parents probably bought that, man, with all the fucking action figures that they bought. And Scott's like, take it home. <laughs> I didn't, but you know. I did take a little piece of the wood, though. Gave it to my mom, and I was like, here's your money back. <laughs> George Lucas says thanks. <laughs> um, all right, we good? Damn pleasure. Thank you for dressing up. What's your name, Captain? Emilio. Emilio, everyone give it up for Emilio. No questions. I just want to say thank you, Mr. Smith, for making Clerks. That movie changed my life. How? Uh, after seeing uh, Dante, I was traumatized. I said, I am Dante. I don't, I don't want to be Dante. So I went back to college, got my second bachelor's degree in accounting, and I have been an accounting officer for the last 23 years. Give it up for him, man. Look at that shit. So, no question. Thank you for saving my ass. <laughs> Fucking Emilio, man, that was wonderful. And I think this is the only place in the world where somebody would ever come up to somebody else and say, thank you for making me an accountant. <laughs> that means the fucking world, man. Clerks saved my life, too. I was Dante as well. Like, I, the movie had the same effect on me. Like, that's why it's about that guy in that place, because that's who I was. So that's how I got to be away from that, man. Like, yo soy Dante, back in the day. But it was Randall's word who struck me and made me see the light. It's fucking fantastic. Thank you for that, man. So, Emilio, if I'm responsible, shouldn't I get like 10% of what you've made? Since... <laughs> Just let me wet my beak a little. What's your name, sir? Ryan. Everyone we'll give it up for Ryan, who's next. So I've been with Ryan years for 25 years. I wore out a VHS copy of Chasing Amy. Thank you. Um, and you, you know, all the things you've talked about in the interviews and the podcasts and stuff you often talk about uh, is just making fun stuff with your friends, enjoying working with your friends all the time. Yes. And I was at a Q&A with David Klein 14 years ago, after, uh, his release of Zack and Mira. Yeah. Uh, um, and he said that he loves working with you, but actually really enjoyed when you guys worked apart and came back, ever having worked with other people, when you worked with like, uh, Virgo or, or Vigo. Was Vigo, uh, 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 Vigo, I was, um, Vilmos Vilmos, Vilmos. Yeah. I was like, Vigo Mortensen, I was like, I've been working with him. <laughs> Vilmos, yes. He said Vilmos actually broke some bad habits of yours and stuff like that, and that he really enjoyed that you both worked apart and then got back to work together. So my question is, yes. do, you, do you seek that out, try to find a balance of working with people you've worked with before and worked with well, or trying to find new people? No, in the case of Dave, they wouldn't let me work with Dave for a while. Like, you gotta understand, I'm a creature of habit, and you, you know, you, I, in my world, you fucking go home with who brought you. And so, in my head, I was gonna make movies with Scott and Dave until we all dropped dead and stuff. So, I assumed that Dave would shoot everything. By the time we got to Dogma, that was like, um, I remember we went up, we were at, at uh, Sundance for Chasing Amy, 
And the movie had played and we got a standing ovation and shit. So I was like, all right, on, we're going to go have a meeting about the next movie, which is Dogma. And at that meeting, like, uh, uh, once again, I'm going to say the name, so clench your assholes, Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> um, he said, um, you can't, he's going, if I green light this movie, Joey, meaning Joey Adams, who was the lead in Chasing Amy, um, Joey can't play Bethany. That's what I've wanted, her to play Bethany. And he said, Dave Klein can't shoot it. And we were like, why? He's like, it's time for you to work with a world-class DP. You can't just keep working with your friends. And so we had to go back down the hill, like during this triumphant fucking week at Sundance, where like we got standing ovation and shit, and people were loving chasing him, the reviews were huge. And we had to go tell like the two people dearest to us that like, you're not going on the next adventure. And it fucking hurt, it sucked. And it was, you know, it was a real growing moment because like you'd like to believe that in that moment that I would have been like, I ain't doing it without it. But that was not the case. It wasn't gonna happen unless I moved forward without them and shit. So I always carry a cross for like leaving Dave behind, so to speak. Dave is much more magnanimous about it because Dave's like, look, I didn't know what the fuck I was doing for the first three movies. He's gone, being forced to go off and learn my craft was the best fucking thing that ever happened to me. Because when we came back together, which was Clerks 2, so I did Dogma with Bob Yeoman, who is Wes Anderson's DP. Uh, then we did Jane Song and Bob Strike Back with Jamie Anderson. And then we did um, Jersey Girl with Bill Moshe Sigmund, who shot, you know, he won an Academy Award for Close Encounter. He's a world class, was a world class DP. No complaints there. But um, I wanted to be with my friend. I wanted to be with the person I went to film school with. We spoke the same language. When we were trying to make clerks in the beginning, at one point I had an idea about hiring this guy, John Thomas, who was a DP, a cinematographer who came with his own camera package. He had shot a movie called Metropolitan uh, for Whit Stillman. So I was like, well, this guy's already shot a fucking movie. And Scott advocated for Dave Klein be gone and saying like, look, if you bring this guy onto our set, he's the one with the most experience. He's making the movie. He's like, if it's Dave, we all got the same fucking experience. No experience. And we're all like equal. And so I was like, all right. He's like, plus Dave's cheaper. And so Dave came out and shot the flick at Dave boys. We called him Baby Dave because he was the youngest of the group. Like Dave was like 18 years old, I think. 18, 19 when we made Clerks. I was like 22, 23 at Mosier, same age. So when we were going to make Clerks 2, that was when I fucking put my foot down, where I was like, we're, we're making Clerks 2 and we're not doing it without Dave. And once again, you gotta say the name, Harvey Weinstein tried to fight it. He was like, no, you gotta work with somebody else. And I was like, bullshit. I was like, the whole fucking gang is coming back. Like Brian, Jeff, Jay, me, Scott, you're gonna leave the fucking guy that shot the movie? Like he's done plenty of shit since then. He knows what he's done. So Dave and I got to work together again on Clerks 2, and by that point, Dave had shot a hundred things and had really fucking learned tricks of the trade and whatnot and had enough confidence to suggest things to me as opposed to me just being like, well, just shoot it like Jarmusch would shoot it or something. And so there was a period from, what was it, Clerks 2, Zach and Mary make a porno, Red State, yeah. Cop Out, where we get to fucking work together again and I got to see Dave be a magician like I got to see my friend the, the kid baby Dave grew into his fucking crap Red State is, is one of the best films I've ever seen shot in my life cinematography wise I'm not saying like it's one of the best movies ever made because I made it that'd be unfair <laughs> but um, in terms of its look fucking Klein slayed it for like the budget we had and stuff so much so that when we were making Red State he went to a meeting about working on True Blood, um, becoming one of the DPs on True Blood. And so we sent clips from the movie so they could see what he did, not like, you know, because Clerks is a beloved movie, but it, it helped everybody except the cinematographer. Because <laughs> nobody ever goes, you know what looks great? Clerks. You know? <laughs> so he, he got to this place where he could show them work that looked like a world-class DP. That didn't look like Kevin Smith's DP. It didn't look like, oh, this is the guy that shot Clark. And he got hired for True Blood, and then from True Blood he went to um, uh, 
Gary Matheson homeland. And then fucking now he's on Star Wars. So Dave shot all of Book of Boba Fett and he's shooting season three of Mandalorian. So we were getting ready to shoot, yeah. We were getting ready to shoot Clerks 3. And I was like, you ready? And he wanted to. And then he was like, they just offered me Mandalorian season three. And I was like, well, fucking, you know, do Star Wars, man. There's a future in Star Wars. <laughs> like, this is the third fucking Clerks. Like, trust me, this you made Clerks so that one day you could do shit like shoot Star Wars. So I was so happy for him that that's the world he is in now. He's like, you know, so many of us lived off of the credit of Clerks for a while. He didn't, he had to like make his bones. And now he lives off of his own fucking reputation. And Clerks is a part of it. And you know, people like love him for it and shit. But he's, he's insanely skilled now. So were it up to me, I would work with the same fucking people over and over and over and over again. And that's why I see the same cast members all the time. I'm a creature of habit. And if it's not broke, don't fix it. Like, you know, fucking like, we all get along, we all communicate well. So fuck it, let's, let's keep this all together. But then sometimes, you know, people just shift and go another direction. Sometimes you're making a movie and somebody's busy on this thing. I'll never forget when we were making Dogma, Jason Lee, I, you know, Bartleby and Loki were supposed to be Ben and Jason Lee, same twosome that was in Chasing Amy. But Jason Lee got offered a movie in France where he's playing a chef or something like that. And I was like, what are you doing, man? We're about to make Dogma. And he's like, yeah, but they're gonna, I'm gonna speak French in a movie. And I'm like, yeah, but that, what the fuck, man? And so he went and took that movie. Our movie was delayed and he was finished with that movie. He was like, is anything still open? And I was like, well, we gave the one part to Matt Damon. I was like, but there is this other part that you can play and stuff. And that was the first time I, bumped into like people having lives outside of me you know like when you're when you're creative you think the whole fucking world centers around you and shit but like dave didn't go to film school to become kevin smith's cinematographer just like scott didn't go to film school to become a producer like they had dreams of their own and they dreamed my dreams for me with me which is like the best and most powerful thing you can do for anybody in this world dream their dream for them and they launched my entire fucking operation. And it felt wrong to be sad or mad when it was time for them to move on and grow and fucking chase their fucking dreams and shit like that. So as much as I'm like, I just want to keep the family together. People, everyone's on their own journey. You know, everyone, everyone's the hero of their own fucking story. They're not just bit players in my story when it's convenient and I'm making a movie. They're leading the story of their lives as well. And you know, it's, it's taken years, but it's one of the things you have to learn as a pro is to be able to let go of the people that you love so that they can go fucking soar. And if you're lucky, you get to come back together again, like me and Dave did for like four or five movies in a row and stuff. So, you know, it's, it's, it's bittersweet to some degree, um, but mostly you're just happy to see your friends excel. Like, you know, uh, Losing Scott, I always talk about losing Scott, I didn't lose him, he's still around, but he stopped producing because Scott was like, I'm, I gotta do my thing. Like, I, I've done Kevin Smith for like 15 years, like, let me try my thing. And he went off and he fucking co-directed The Grinch, movie made like hundreds of millions of dollars. And when it came out, I was so like, I remember telling him, I was like, I feel bad, I feel like I've held you back all this time. Like, this was your fucking, this is what you were meant to do. And Moses was very gracious about it. He was like, no, that's how I got to that. All the shit that we did, he was like, how do you think I was gonna get to the fucking Grinch otherwise? He's going, it's all the movies we made, all the podcasting we did, everything we ever did together helped get to that fucking moment. And that made me feel a little bit better. Because as a creative, you, you, you tend, I, you use people. I don't mean use them like I used you maliciously, but like, you, you're just this fucking sponge that like just takes everybody in and takes in all their energy to make your fucking thing. And, you know, at a certain point, as much as like I loved making stuff with Scott and Dave, Scott and Dave had to go reach their destinies and shit. And then at that point, you're just on the sidelines and you're like, 
fucking right on, just like they have been for me for the better part of like 20 years. Try not to get emotional. Anyway, <laughs> yes. Um, if I could, I'd work with all the same people. If, if I could, it would have been the same three, four people that worked on Clerks to the end of my life. But you got to grow sometimes. Thank you. Thank you. What's your name? Oh, my name is Raul. And we'll give it up for Raul as next. Before the hurricane, uh, I, I still know that there are very good incentives here in Puerto Rico to film. Yeah. So I was, uh, I wanted to ask you if, uh, would you consider filming a movie here? I, I mean, I'll be honest with you. Up until today, never, because I was like, well, I've not been there. But fucking the moment I was landing, I was like, why doesn't anyone shoot a movie here? Like this place is fucking gorgeous. Um, so yeah, if I had something that called for it. Absolutely. Generally speaking, the stuff I do is pretty not fun. Like, you know, doesn't call for the sun and the beach or anything like that. Doesn't call for, like, uh, luxurious living. But I, 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 I now, having seen the place, absolutely, in a heartbeat, I could conceive of shooting a movie here. Um, it would have to be somebody else's movie that they gave me a bunch of money to do, because I, I would, I can't imagine, like, you know, I... There was that, what was that movie, Forgetting Sarah Marshall? Like, there's, an, I, there, there's a movie I, I'm not saying I could have or should have, but like, that's in my wheelhouse. It's like people talking, but in a very beautiful location. So I guess maybe, you know, it's, yeah, it's possible. Because I was sitting there going like, I don't, I don't tell big enough stories, but, you know, it's a beach town. I've been telling beach town stories my whole life, so I could get my head around that. Yeah, it could happen. Thank you. Holy shit. Hello. <laughs> How are you, Kenneth? So good, man. Uh, that's good. My What's name's your name? Oh, well, my name is Kenneth. Uh, Kenneth? Yes. Everyone uh, give it up for Kenneth. In case you can't see, Kenneth is cosplaying at the moment a little bit. He, yeah, he, yeah. As a camp counselor. Is that a camp counselor yeah, whistle? Camp counselor Jason. Yeah. Camp counselor Jason uh, Voorhees. So that's wonderful. Welcome by uh, Jamie Lee, I believe. Name of the artist. Uh, I don't know what her handle is right now, but never mind. Uh, my question is really simple, but I think you already kind of answered it. Uh, it's regarding horror movies, uh, specifically horror movie franchises. I yes. kind of just wanted to ask you, as a director or writer, is there any movie or franchise that you've dreamed about writing or directing? I, I said you already kind of answered because you, you mentioned Marvel and Star Wars, so I'm guessing it's the same type of thing for horror. Um, no, horror was my first love before independent film. Like, long before I wanted to be an independent filmmaker, I wanted to be uh, Tom Savini or Rick Baker. I wanted to do special effects makeup. But I'm not an artist. I'm not good like that. Like, you know, I don't know why I thought I could do it. It just seemed like a cool job and shit. Um, but horror was a big part of my childhood. You know, it's not like I grew up watching independent films or something. That came in my 20s. So it was all rubber splatter movies, you know, rubber monster mask splatter movies and shit like that. That's why Tusk and Yogo is the way they are and the and the when we get to it finally, moose jaws will be the same thing. Big rubber fucking moose eating people and shit. So I I, I could do my thing. I can't you know, I, I don't know that I would pick up somebody else's thing like uh, David Gordon Green has been doing the Halloween movies and stuff. I like I couldn't I don't think I could do that. Like, if, for example, when they announced that that first Halloween movie he was making wasn't, like, it was only connected to the first Halloween, and they were disavowing Halloween 2 and, and all the other Michael Myers movies, like, as a, as a fan, like, I was like, you can't do that. Like, and so if I was the creative in charge, the movie wouldn't happen, because I'm like, well, that's too good an idea. Don't do that, you know? So I, I probably shouldn't be allowed near a franchise, which is cool because I never go near them. But if there was one where somebody was like, you could make one of these, it'd be down to two. I would love to do a Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but like, but like part two, because that's my favorite, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. It's such a fucked up movie. It's so terrifying. Aside from like the gore and the violence, 
it just psychologically fucked up. So that's like, whenever I make a movie like Red State or Tusk, I'm trying to emulate that. Because I remember seeing that movie and being blown away by it. Like, this is fucking bizarre. Is either one of those, a Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but in the vein of part two. Um, or one of my favorite movies of all time, my favorite horror movies, and also has influenced how I do horror, is American Werewolf in London. I fucking loved that movie when I was a kid because it was a scary movie, but they balanced it out with some humor every once in a while. And that was new. Now they do that fucking shit all the time. But when I was a kid, that was brand new. The idea of like, we're gonna fucking show you something grisly and then somebody's gonna hold up the Mickey Mouse doll and make, you know, make jokes and shit. So because of that, like that's why Tusk and Red State tonally are the way they are. Because I love the tone of American Werewolf where you could be sitting there like really enjoying five, 10, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, we got 10 minutes left. You could be really fucking enjoying a horror movie and shit and then all of a sudden you get like a, a stress release laugh and then they cut somebody's fucking head off. Like they just keep you spinning and stuff. So if, I, if, if somebody gave me a blank check and they're like, all the good directors have died, we need you to make one of these, then I, I could get my head around one or two of those. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent outfit, man. Killer cosplay. How are you, my friend? What's your name? My name is Mr. Smith. My name is Nestor. Longtime fan. Give it up for Nestor, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so giddy, I feel like I've been waiting over 25 years for this moment. I feel like I've been waiting fucking 45 because you're my first Nestor. <laughs> Other than the holiday special I watched as a child, Nestor the Long-Eared Donkey. <laughs> and that story is about the long-eared donkey, he's kind of like the Rudolph of donkeys, who was in the fucking manger, or in the stable, when Jesus was born. This was a fucking cartoon they showed to kids, like a Rankin-based kid uh, cartoon, like Puppetoons and shit like that. So, you're my first fucking Nestor, man. This is... Honor. Anyway. And for those who were like 45 years, I was six when I saw Nestor, hence the math. I'm 51. Anyway, back to you, Nestor. Of course, um, I was gonna ask if you had like any other works such as like Red, Red State and Iron... Uh, Tusk, I'm sorry, but I think we mostly want to hear like stories from your end. Uh, do you have like any funny story to share? Like uh, maybe uh, you know Snoop Dogg one time told everybody in one of his interviews like, hey, the the most stuff, um, you know, uh, when he was smoking with uh, Willie Nelson. Do you have like any story like that you might want to share with us? I'm trying to think, have I ever smoked with Willie Nelson? <laughs> Um, or Snoop Dogg. No, I, I, I mean, this is gonna sound weird, but I, I, I smoke alone. Like, I'm not a communal <laughs> social <laughs> smoker. Social smoke. Yeah, like, uh, not so much where I'm like, fuck off! <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, fucking, like I'm shooting up in a corner or something. But generally speaking, when I smoke, uh, other than today, like, when I was smoking with the con kids and stuff, um, I'm generally in my office writing and just fucking smoking joint after joint so i'm i to me not because i choose it but smoking is a very solitary experience uh because i associate with with work so much i because when i became i didn't become stoner until i was 38 and when i became stoner i was like if you're gonna do this if you're gonna make this decision and change your fucking life Make sure that you're productive. That's the only thing you've got to do. Like, if you're going to smoke a joint, make sure you're recording a podcast, you're writing a script, you're fucking directing a movie, whatever the fuck, it has to be tied to productivity. Otherwise, you're going to be called, like, a fucking stoner or a loser or whatever the fuck, and you slip down some fucking hole. So I was like, I'm going to show these people that you can be a fucking degenerate stoner and still get a bunch of things done, so long as those things don't require heavy machinery or anything like that. <laughs> it's just made up stuff. So, I don't have any like fucking cool, like I smoked with this person stories, but I do have the story of the first time I smoked as an adult. I smoked weed when I was a kid. You can count on one hand the amount of times I smoked weed prior to 2008, which is weird because most people are like, what, you made fucking Jay and Silent Bob movies. I was like, not as a stoner, isn't that impressive? <laughs> um, 
It wasn't until I became, uh, worked on Zack and Mary Make a Porno, that's when I became a stoner because I worked with Seth Rogen. <laughs> <laughs> and Seth is the best commercial for pot productivity on the planet. I was raised in the 80s, so my mentality was just say no and fucking weed is a drug and people who are stoners sit on their couches and watch cartoons, they don't get shit done. Seth was the first productive stoner I've ever met in my life. Not only was he making our movie, but he was writing two other movies with Evan while he was in his trailer and he was working on three other things. He, he could balance so much. He, he broke the stereotype for me. Stereotype had always been like, <laughs> and I kept that stereotype going. You look at our movies, it's not like we held stoners in a high regard. We're like, they're kind of silly. Seth was the first one I met who was like, no, he's going, there's a bunch of us. He's going, there's a very, you know, creative component in this business of Wake and Bakers. And I was like, I couldn't imagine this. It happened because we were on set making Zack and Mary and my friend Malcolm um, was with us. My friend Malcolm Ingram, he directed a documentary about me called Clerk, which came out this year. Um, he's, uh, I only tell you this not to tell you tales out of school, but it's a big part of his identity. Malcolm is a bear. He's a large gay man who identifies as a bear and shit. And if you don't know what that is, I'll give you Malcolm's explanation when I asked. I was like, what's a bear? He's like, I'm a guy who shouldn't have sex with hot dudes, but I do. <laughs> and he's like, so if you ever want to be one, you'd be a hell of a bear. <laughs> he's like, if you ever want to leave your wife, I was like, I'll keep it, keep, it in, keep it in mind, Malcolm. So Malcolm was with me on set, and he tends to be very dramatic. Like everything is, you know, Malcolm's kind of movie where you come out of, Malcolm's kind of guy, you come out of a movie like, what'd you think? And he goes, I was a fucking abortion of cinema. That kind of shit, you know, but larger than life. So he comes up to me on set one day and we were like midway through shooting Zack and Mary make a corner. And he's like, uh, Seth Rogen wants to smoke weed with you. And I was like, oh, well, I don't smoke weed. He's like, oh, well, I know that, but Seth Rogen doesn't know that. And he's like, you're going to disappoint him? And I was like, well, why would that be disappointing? He's going, because you're a fucking iconic cinematic stoner, and he's an iconic cinematic stoner. You have to fucking smoke together. And I was like, I could never smoke weed and make a movie. That's all I do now. Um, I was like, it's impossible. I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. So we finished making the movie. It was the last day of production, and it was just pickups with Seth. So Banks was gone. Everyone else, the whole cast was gone. It was just pickup shots with Seth as Zach, little like one shots and stuff. So we were almost done shooting and I fucking sidled up to Seth at one point and I was like, hey man, we're almost done shooting. So let's say after rap, we go up to the editing room, I show you some of the cut footage and we smoke some of that weed I've been hearing so much about. And he goes, finally. <laughs> And so he came up to the editing room, and we're in Pittsburgh, and uh, Pittsburgh in 2008 was not a hotbed of fucking, you know, cannabis activity, but mercifully, Seth had stuff from California. So, for the first time in, I don't know, fucking years, on that set, I had, uh, not the set in the editing room, I had a joint with fucking Seth, and I loved who the fuck I was because of it. Like, I, I loved that I was relaxed and I was not like up in my own head and shit like that. I loved how we were talking. I was like, this shit's fucking amazing, man. He was like, right? He's like, this is the only way to live and stuff. He's like, I wake and bake. I was like, I could never do that. He's going, but you should let weed into your life. I was like, I, I might. And then I didn't do it for like six months. And six months later, um, the kid was gone. The kid, uh, my, uh, Jen's parents took the kid away for, 4th of July. And so me and Jen had the house to ourselves. Generally, we live with her parents and, and our kid, and, and now they're all moved out. It's just me and Jen in this house. But back then, you know, family and shit. So when they left, Jen was like, we have the house to ourselves, man. Let's just do something fucking naughty, man. Let's just, let's get hookers or something. Like fucking, there ain't no parents here. There ain't no kid. Let's fucking like have a black mass, anything, just fucking. So I was like, well, we got weed in the safe that Trish, her friend, had given us like three years before. I was like, we can roll a joint. I had a joint with Seth Rogen a couple months ago and it was really fun. And she was like, all right. And so I rolled this terrible joint, we smoked. 
and I had the best night of my life with my wife, man. We got so blazed, we took a cab to his pre-Uber, to this restaurant called Simon LA, and ordered this like dessert platter called The Circus. And it was just cotton candy, fucking snowballs, chocolate shakes, peanut butter desserts, just all sugar. And we're feeding each other and fucking like their grapes and we're fucking Greek gods. It was amazing. Then we went home and fucking like we got out of the car and we saw our neighbors who we never really talked to heading into their house. And we were so baked, we were like, hey, what's going on? And they were like, hello. And we're like, we see you guys been doing work over there. What you guys doing? And they're like, we're, we're putting a new counter in the kitchen. We're like, can we see it? And they were like, uh, okay. And they brought us into their fucking house and shit, into the kitchen. They're like, it's new counter, it's cherry wood. And I was rubbing it going, ooh, cherry wood. <laughs> you know, and then me and Jen went across the street to our house and just like fucked all night long. And I was like, I love smoking weed. I was like, so Seth's right. I'm gonna incorporate weed into my life. I said, but I can't be like him. I, I, you know what I'll do? I will smoke at night. Like when my work is done at eight o'clock at night, I will, I will, I've earned a joint. I'll do that. And so I started doing that. I did that for a week. Started smoking at eight o'clock at night. And after a week of that, I was like, I mean, I don't know why I'm waiting till eight o'clock at night. Like, I, mean, I don't really have a real job, so I could probably start at like, I don't know, fucking three o'clock. So I started smoking at three o'clock and shit. And after a week of that, I was like, you know, like fucking, who are we kidding? Life would be so much better if you just started smoking the moment you woke up. And I became a wake and bake stoner and stuff. And so it was gradual. And rather than let it be a gradual slide to the place like where people were like, your productivity is dropped and shit like that. I tied it to productivity to make sure that whenever I smoke, I'm making a thing. And so I give that to Seth, man. Like without Seth, breaking down that barrier and, and, and stomping on the stereotype of what a stoner was, I wouldn't be as fucking happy as I am today. Now, there's some people that are like, yeah, but your movies were better before you were a stoner. I don't know, like, again, that, that's up to the audience. But as a, as a person, not just as an artist making the movies, but as a human being and shit like that, we changed my life so much for the better. Like, you can go back and watch old interviews with me, and I'm so, like, cringy artist. Like, I'm always just like, yeah, man, we had to make this movie, and it was a real pain in the ass. Like, everything is so, everything's a struggle and shit like that. And then once I started smoking weed, I was like, life is fucking amazing, you know? <laughs> and I'm very expressive, and like, you know, I start crying all over the place. I get made fun of a lot now, because I cry on the internet and shit. Um, not not like professionally, but it just happens from time to time. Like I'll watch a Marvel movie and love it and I put post a picture of myself crying. And some people hate it, like fucking to death. I love it. Like it, it makes me so fucking happy. I love being in touch with my feelings to the point where an episode of Moon Knight will move me to tears, you know? Like and I think people in this room would understand that as well. So it's not a great story, like smoking weed with Willie Nelson and, uh, and, and Snoop Dogg, but smoking weed with Seth Rogen absolutely fucking changed my life for the better, man. I just wish the movie had done better for him and shit, because he gave me such a gift and I gave him Zach and Mary. <laughs> Five? Here we go. Over to you. What's your name? Uh, my name is Kenai Gonzalez. What is it? Kenai Gonzalez. Like the, the bear from... I, just, I can't hear. There's a speaker that's behind me. One more time. Can I come You know, like the bear from. Can I? Yeah. Give it up for him. <laughs> it's still going here. So my only question is, uh, knowing that Star Wars is a big part of your life, bringing back that topic, what was it like getting a cameo in Star Wars? That was pretty impressive. For those that don't know, I got uh, two cameos in the in the jj movies he made force awakens and he made rise of skywalker so in uh, force awakens um he let me be a stormtrooper voice i was like you're gonna let me play a stormtrooper he goes you would never fit in the outfit <laughs> so he's like someone else will play it it'll be your voice so i went to see uh force awakens in boulder colorado i was out doing a tour and jen my wife was with me and shit and we went to to the theater, you know, and saw the movie and shit, and I heard my voice, but I wasn't sure which one it was, because oddly enough, you'd think I could pick up my voice, but it was gone through a stormtrooper filter, so I was like, I don't know, I think I was that guy. But during the credits, 
he has the credits for Roland. There was my name in those fucking blue credits that I've been watching my whole fucking life. Yes. So I, were, I was heading to the car afterwards with Jen, and she's like, oh my God, what are you feeling right now? Like, what is, what's going through your head and shit? And I was just like, I would love to go back in time and see that little kid that his parents took him to see Star Wars with his brother and sister. And, you know, fucking be like, hey man, one day, like, you're gonna fucking be in one of these movies, kinda. And I'm sure young me would be like, we get to direct Star Wars? <laughs> and old me would be like, oh no, God no, no. They, they don't let you near shit like that. But, but you know, you, you do get to be kinda in one with your voice. And then I had a heart attack four years ago. And everybody was real nice when he almost died, including JJ. And JJ uh, wrote me an email when I was in the hospital. He was like, if you fucking stay alive, I'll put you in the next Star Wars, bitch. You know, it was a nice thing to write, but fucking a year later, I fucking wrote it back and I was like, I stayed alive. <laughs> and he was like, all right, come on out. And then went to England and uh, they shot it at Pinewood, I think it's called. And. Um, that one I got to actually physically be in. If you blink and you miss me and shit like that, but like, there I am walking through that snowy village. And, and um, that was nuts. Like, I, I'll never forget watching, it wasn't so much nuts for me, but being there and watching JJ was so impressive because it's exactly like you imagine it. Like, you're, the, the director is playing Star Wars with life-size action figures essentially. So I was there when they brought 12, 20 characters, fully fucking made up, like just background characters. Some are involved, two people in a costume with fucking legs, uh, some are robots, some, you know, are obviously monsters and aliens that we've seen and stuff like that. But he had them all lined up and they were like, which ones do you want for the scene? And like JJ's in the middle of all the, this ring, of fucking action figures waiting to happen. And he's just going like, I'm gonna take him up there, I'm gonna take this guy in the door, he's gonna come out and then he's gonna go back in. I'm gonna take these two up in that top corner over there. It was, it was so fun, it was like, and nothing like that, I was like, ooh, I wish I was in charge. Not at all, it looked like a lot of responsibility. But to see him, like to see the job reduced to what it really is, you know, because we're, we're adults when we make movies, and so people treat it like it's a real profession or a career. But it's literally fucking make pretend. It's the same shit you did as a child with your friends, where you're like, all right, you're fucking Luke Skywalker, I'm gonna be Darth Vader. Go, pew, 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 and shit like that. So watching it boil down to that, watching that moment where this kid in a candy store is being shown all the toys that he's allowed to play with, and he's just gonna pick a few and put them in that scene was absolute bliss. It was nice to be a fly on the wall for that sort of thing. I felt really happy for him and shit. But never once was I like, man, I wish that was me. Like, if you fuck up a Star Wars, they hate you forever, man. Yeah. Like, you know, I took enough shit for Masters of the Universe. I don't know if I ever <laughs> want to, want to deal with that Star Wars shit, man. Not fair you liked it? Thank you very much. Thank you. Hopefully we get to do more. Uh, okay, over to you. Ruben Sufjan. My question is, do you still collect comic books and which one is your favorite? What a great question. Give it up for him. What's your name, kid? Ruben Sufjan. Can't hear that. Um, Ruben. Ruben. Ruben? Give it up for Ruben, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, what a great question, Ruben. Nobody ever asks me that. Um, I stopped collecting comics when I bought Jay and Silent Bob's Secret Stash. I own a comic book store and I've owned it for 25 years. So it seemed redundant to have a collection when I owned the entire store. So it just felt like I have a collection, people just pick through it and buy whatever they want. So at that point it freed me up from like, I gotta get my new books every week. But I'll be honest with you, Making Clerks freed me up from that as well, because I sold my comic books to get the movie made, 
And that was liberating as hell, man. Like, because I lived my life by my comic books, bagged and boarded them. I would buy oversized boards in small bags so I could trim the boards, slip them in the bag so you could bounce a fucking quarter off them. There was no room in that bag. It, was, it kept your comic book so tight. Like, I poured everything into my comic book collection. And I was terrified things would happen to it. When my mother wanted to fuck with me, if she was ever like, you know, you gotta clean your room. I was like, no, I'm going out with my friend. She's like, when you come home, all your comic books are gonna be on the floor. And I was like, all right, I ain't going anywhere. And I just protect my comic books and shit. So I was deeply invested in them. But then when I sold them to a store, not for money, but for store credit, and then I would trade that store credit to my friend Walter Flanagan. If he bought $100 worth of comics, he would give me 80 cash. He'd use 100 on my credit, and then give me 80 cash. And that's how I paid off the credit card minimums that were coming in on, on Clerks, the movie, the first movie I made. So that moment when I let go of the collection, and it was like a, you know, I'd done a fucking buyer's guide um, breakdown of what it was, and it was about a $10,000 collection. No big books, no like Golden Age or Silver Age. It was all pretty modern stuff but I'd been collecting for like a good few years at that point. Um, once I let it go, there was this freedom that I hadn't known in years. Suddenly I could leave the house and it wouldn't matter. Like when we, we had a flood, um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with bad weather, but in New Jersey, <laughs> um, we had a nor'easter back in like 1992. And you know, in my town, we lived at below sea level. Highlands, my hometown is literally below sea level. So we would get water in the streets during high tide and shit, but we never had like water come over the bulkhead. And um, me and Jason Muse, the guy who plays Jay in the movies, we owned two cars together, two Volkswagens. One that we drove, one he was fixing up that we were gonna sell. And he calls me that night uh, before the flood happened. And he's like, they're saying that the town's gonna flood. And I was like, yeah, but my driveway never floods. He goes, shouldn't we move the cars uptown? And I was like, you're out of your fucking mind, man. They're going to stay right in my garage. I don't trust you driving those cars in this weather. And she woke up the next morning. Didn't wake up. My mother comes into my room, wakes me, shakes me. She's like, get up. If you want to save your comic books, you better get up right now. I didn't know what the fuck she was talking about. So I stumbled out of bed and I put my foot on the floor. And the rug was higher than it normally was. Normally it was close to the floor. The rug was bubbled up because there was all this water under it and I stepped on it and the water enveloped my foot and then I looked out my window and I saw that we were in a flood zone for the first time in my life and that flood water was coming to my fucking comic books and the first thing I did was take all my comic books and fucking pile them into this big comforter on my bed, open the attic and fucking hurl them up there and shit. While Liam, you know, my parents were like, your cars, they're underwater. I was like, fuck the cars, my comics. <laughs> And Jay Muse is like, yeah, good plan, leaving the cars in your driveway and shit. And then it turned out to be a good plan because at the end of the day, um, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, came through our towns. The town was decimated. It wasn't as bad as it was years later with Hurricane Sandy that destroyed the New Jersey shore. But this was the 92 Nor'easter. So FEMA came through and nobody, we didn't have power. All the houses were fucking flooded and shit. And you know, you give them like, this is what I lost. I lost this, I lost a car. And they try to reimburse you to get you going. I'm sure some people have experience with that here. <laughs> so me and Jay, Jay's like, we gotta go and we gotta file for our cars. And I was like, why? And it's like, they're $200 cars. Like, and they're both dead. They're full of water. Like, they're not gonna give us any money. He's like, we should apply. And so we went and waited in line at the borough hall and shit and filled in the application. And like, it's me and this kid who's four years younger than me. And so if I'm 22, that means Jason's 18. And so we come up with our applications for FEMA for our two Volkswagens that were destroyed in the flood. And the person, the lady who's at the desk, she's looking at the application, she looks at us and she's like, are you brothers? And we were like, no. And she's looking at the application, she looks at us and she goes, are you married? <laughs> and I was like, no, we just own communal property. And so she's like, okay. And she's like, well, I don't know how much we can get you for the cars, but we'll definitely file the paperwork and let you know. And I never thought we'd hear from them again. And then fucking they sent us a check for $4,000. <laughs> that Jason was like, half of that's mine. And I was like, absolutely. My half went into making clerks. So the fucking flood that took my cars and shit wound up paying for the house, uh, paying, for the, paying for the movie. Um, the house got decimated but I was able to save my comics, and those comics I then sold to a comic book store and they paid for the movie as well. 
everything kind of ties together. But you didn't ask that. You asked, do I still read comic books? I don't, but I write them. Thing is, and I, this is not an excuse, but I read comics at a time when, um, I'm not gonna call it the golden age of comics, but they, there was an era where they were making stories that I was deeply involved in, and then they changed. As the comic book companies do from time to time, they reboot their entire universe. DC had the new 52, Marvel has rebooted a number of fucking times. And you know, it's not like they negate all those old stories that I loved, but they're not following my continuity anymore. Now they're just telling different stories. And I appreciate that, and I'm glad that goes on, particularly for you know young up-and-coming comic book fans who are like, I didn't read all the old shit that you used to read instead. But the stories that I care about, and the storylines, and the continuity that, like, that was my religion is gone. It's just one of many continuities out there. And it's not a sad thing. It's like, you know, we've now seen pop culture like take over comic books. Now there are TV shows and movies and shit like that. Video games to continue some of the classic stories that I've loved or to repurpose them and stuff. But it's just not the same. Like I'm in a different place in my life than what I was when I was reading those books. And when I say a different place, I don't mean like I was a kid when I read those comic books. I was reading those comic books up until the age of like 32 years old. But the stories that they're telling are for a new generation, uh, not for, for me. And I love a superhero story. This is my favorite kind of story in the fucking world, man. Because, you know, maybe it's because I was raised Catholic and, and so there's a biblical moral edge to these stories. But I love them because they're very simple and very beautiful. Because they tell the same story over and over and over and over again. Very simple story. Every comic book story is this. Worst thing in the world is fucking happening. And everybody is running from it except one person dressed very colorfully heading right toward her. Like, I'll, I'll, I will be a sucker for that story for the rest of my life. And now they do it cinematically. When I was a kid, I had to read comics because they weren't making comic book super, uh, movies, uh, movies but comic book superheroes and stuff. Now they do. And those stories are just as good, if not better, than some of the shit I used to read in print. So it's a golden age again for storytelling, but the medium has changed for me. That being said, I'm writing comics more than I've ever been writing them before. We launch a comic book imprint with Dark Horse in the fall called Secret Stash Press. So for the last six months, I've been writing a comic book, a vigilante comic book called Miss Masquerade, which will come out um, in the fall. And then I've been writing this other comic book, which is called Quick Stops, which is an anthology book that takes all the characters, Dante Randall, Jay Silent Bob, and tells mashup stories with them. So I'm writing comics, but I'm not reading them at this point. Uh, that being said, one leads to the other, because I guarantee you I'm gonna see the first criticism on the book I write. Somebody's gonna be like, this guy hasn't read a comic book in years, and that's gonna make me fucking read a comic book. Because I saw somebody talk about something I had written, and they were like, he writes like the 90s comic books. And that makes sense, because those are the comic books that like, I was raised and reared on. Those are the stories that mean the most to me. When I write a comic book, I'm, I don't do it well, but I'm desperately trying to emulate either Alan Moore, Frank Miller, Neil Gaiman, Peter Milligan, Grant Morrison, the people whose writing like fucking stole, captured my imagination and wouldn't give it back. So short answer, which I'm no good at, <laughs> I, uh, I, don't, uh, I don't read comic books uh, currently, but I do write them. And to be fair, as I told my kid from a young age, like, you can read comic books or you can write them. One of them's more fun. Being in charge is always way more fun. Yes? Hi, Kevin. What's your name? Jennifer. Everyone give it up for Jennifer, man. And I'm a YouTuber. You're a YouTuber? Yes. Fucking A, a creator, a fellow maker. How are you? Very good, and I'm such a huge fan. I have a recommendation and one question. Okay. I recommend you to go to the rainforest El Junque and a restaurant called Raíces, and you're gonna love it. And you have to try the mofongo. And what do I have to try? Mofongo. The mofongo? Yes. Mofongo. Mofongo? Yeah. What is it? It's um like plantain made from green banana, but it's like plantain and it's like brown like this, and you can add it with meat. Well, you could put meat in. Yes. But as a vegan, I would. Yes, it is vegan. Um, fucking A, all right, well, fun go. Yeah, and my question is, um, will you do season three, Master of Universe? 
Um, I, I hope so. Uh, it's not up to me. If it were up to me, we'd be there already. But it's always up to somebody else. So I'm huge fan. Thank you. We're still standing by, and, and, and fingers crossed. It looks very good, but I, I think so. Uh, I hope so. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> What's your name? Marcel. What is it? Marcel. Marcel. <clears throat> Marcel. Marceau? Yeah. Give it up for Marceau, everybody. Marceau, you've got a scratch shirt. Marcel, what? Marcel, like this chef. Yes. Were you, were you at the stash you just ordered? You been there? Yes. Fucking hey, thank you for going. He's been to the, my comic book store in Jersey. I tried to meet you. Last you tried October. to meet me? I tried to meet you there last October. Was I there or no? I was there a couple days ago. It was actually my first comic con. Okay, this one here? Yes. Well, let me ask you a question. I mean, How have you enjoyed... Enjoy <laughs> you will ask one too. How have you enjoyed your first Comic-Con? So far, so good. So far, so good, right? Yes. Give it up for the PR Comic-Con, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Okay. I'm actually a fan of yours since the 90s. Quentin Tarantino. I actually connected with my girl, the Clerks 2. Love that movie. And you know, there's a million fine women out there. They don't all buy me tickets to meet you. They mostly just don't even buy me tickets to come to the comic <laughs> So I want to ask her to marry me. Did you hear that? Where are you? Yes. Let's get her up to the microphone. Come on over here. Oh my God, something important is happening, ladies and gentlemen. He's down on one knee. She said yes! Oh my god, they're gonna wed each other! Give it up for Marcel, ladies and gentlemen. He just made a fucking life choice. <laughs> myself out here. I'm probably going to be back within the next three months because my wife saw pictures and she was like, we're going back and shit. Um, so I will have sex in Puerto Rico, just not this trip. I thank you all for being here, ladies and gentlemen. I thank you all for being passionate about uh, the, the art uh, that we all love so much. Uh, the world of the graphic arts, comic books, comic book culture. Um, there are a lot of people out there who when you tell them, like, I'm going to a Comic Con, they're like, what? And they've never been to one, like Marcel today. And then you come, and it changes everything. Like, to the point where this guy's marrying somebody after a comic con, man. So thank you for coming out to see me. Thank you to the good folks at the PR Comic Con for bringing me out here. Don't forget, this fall, Clerks 3 is coming. And I'll tell you what. This time we're bringing the movie to Puerto Rico to show it, man. For sure. I love you all, ladies and gentlemen. Have a great fucking night. Enjoy your week. Hey,